So it's a great honour to be here tonight uh, opening the festival and um, thank you for coming on this lovely evening. So I was going to talk a little bit about what I do uh, this evening. So my job is to go where wars are. I fly to places where normal people are leaving. Sometimes I look around at other people serving in shops or on the tube with their briefcases, going to offices, and I wonder what it's like to have a normal life with a job where you just go to work and come back at the end of the day and don't have to worry about being shot at or suicide bombed or kidnapped or ending up in one of those videos with a knife at your throat. Occasionally, for light relief, I get natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, even the occasional famine. In my fridge, between the bottles of Sauvignon Blanc and tomato ketchup, there's a, a cholera vaccine. And in my wardrobe, where most women keep their little black dress, I keep a flak jacket. Sometimes this leads to extreme situations. On the 18th of October 2007, when I should have been at my son's parents' evening, I was on Benazir Bhutto's bus when it was blown up in the biggest bomb in Pakistan's history. Victoria Schofield was also there. Um, I'd known Benazir for 20 years. In fact, she had a huge impact on my career. I got to interview her when I was starting out as an intern at the Financial Times, and she was living here in London as Pakistan's opposition leader, but in exile. So the day of our interview was the day that she announced her engagement to Asif Ali Zadari, and her apartment was absolutely full of bouquets of flowers. Um, she then went back to Pakistan. I went to work in Birmingham for Central TV. And one day I came home from work, and there was the most beautiful gold-inscribed wedding invitation on my um, doormat, and it was to her wedding. So that wedding was my first introduction to Pakistan. Not only was it incredibly colorful, but every night after the ceremony, there would be gatherings in Benazir's house of her political colleagues to discuss toppling Pakistan's then military dictator, General Zia. I met people who told me about being tortured and tear gassed and arrested in their struggle for trying to bring democracy to Pakistan, something that I'd always taken for granted. I thought about my own life at the time, the most dangerous thing I'd ever done was trying to find my way home late at night after missing the last train in London. And I couldn't really imagine um, what they were going through. So somehow covering local news in Birmingham, which was what I was doing, didn't really seem very exciting in comparison. Moreover, as I was the youngest and one of the few females in the newsroom, and we were in an area which had lots of motorway crashes, I used to get the truly awful job of going and knocking on the door of relatives of victims of motorway crashes and asking for their photographs. Um, that, of course, was before Facebook. So I decided that I would move to Pakistan. And the last story I ever did for Central TV, actually, was a man who turned his car back to front, so it looked like it was going forwards when it was going backwards. I don't think I was a great loss to TV. But when I talked to foreign editors here about Pakistan, they told me that they weren't interested General Zia had been in power for 11 years, and they didn't think that anything was going to change, despite Benazir Bhutto's return. At that time, the Russians, however, were in Afghanistan. So they suggested to me, why don't you go and cover that instead? So I took something called the flying coach up the Grand Trunk Road to Peshawar on the edge of the Khyber Pass, and I started work as a foreign correspondent even though, actually, I had no idea what foreign correspondents did. I started traveling across the border into Afghanistan with the Mujahideen fighting the Russians. I'm going to show you a really attractive picture. <laughs> um, Pakistan's intelligence, ISI, had used the old British divide and rule to create seven Afghan resistance parties so that they could control them and play them off against each other. 
And because I had got no idea what foreign correspondents did, and most of them just went to see the most important of the resistance parties, but I went to see all seven, which meant that I even went to the smallest one. And the spokesperson of the smallest party was this kind of skinny Afghan in a leather jacket who loved Somerset Morn stories and Cadbury's chocolate and Tennyson poetry, and who told me that if you want to understand Afghanistan, you need to understand the tribes of southern Afghanistan. His name was Hamid Karzai, and we became close friends. I had been in Pakistan for less than four months when General Zia died in a mysterious air crash, which some say was caused by a box of exploding mangoes. And Benazir ended up becoming prime minister, though of course it wasn't long till the army saw her off again. So when she returned to Pakistan in 2007, after nine years in exile, she asked me to go with her. I wasn't intending to be on her bus, over that year, I'd had several narrow escapes. I'd been ambushed by the Taliban in Helmand and was in a hotel that had been suicide bombed. And when I interviewed Benazir in London, not far from here, actually near Edgware Road, on the eve of her return, Benazir told me that she'd had lots of assassination threats. So my plan was to go on the media bus behind. But then we landed in Karachi, and I saw the crowds, and I saw her on top of the bus, and I knew that I had to be there. It was fine to start with. The atmosphere was electric. Benazir was overjoyed to be back. There were huge crowds, people everywhere, on roofs, up trees, up lampposts. There was music playing, um, even doves being released. But I could see that on an open-top bus, we were very exposed, particularly as the route to the Jinnah Mausoleum, where she was due to speak, took us under 15 bridges and flyovers. I asked the head of security, how are you going to protect Benazir? And he said to me, it's in God's hands, which I didn't really find very reassuring. <laughs> With so many people in the street, our progress was very slow, and it got dark. Benazir pointed out to me that the streetlights kept going off. Also, the jammers, which were supposed to block any remote signals that could set off suicide bombs, were clearly not functioning as all our mobile phones were working. However, there was so much excitement, and the journey, as I said, went on so long, in fact, we were on that bus for nine hours, that we even ordered in pizza on the bus, and we were joking about having to order in breakfast too. So I forgot about the danger. It was a complete shock when suddenly there was a low boom, like the sound of a concrete, of a steel door scraping across concrete. The bus lurched and the music stopped. I'd been near suicide bombings before, so I know that often there's a small blast to start with and then gets everybody kind of stopped and then there's a much bigger blast. So I was shouting at people to stay down, but very quickly, within a minute, there was a second explosion, much louder, and then there was just orange flame everywhere. Then there was silence, and then sirens. I was terrified that the fuel tank would catch fire. Um, we didn't know then it was in a special lead casing. So we all jumped off the top of this double-decker bus and ran like crazy through all the blood and plastic sandals and body parts. 150 people were killed that night. Afterwards, back at my hotel, when I was washing off the flecks of people's burnt flesh in the shower, I thought, that's it. I'd already had way more than my nine lives and I wondered if it was time to quit. My first evening back in London after that, I went for a dinner to honor somebody called Beatrice Matetwa, who is a very brave human rights lawyer from Zimbabwe. It's a country that I had reported a lot from, even though British journalists were banned at the time, and I'd been named an enemy of the state. I was actually accused of writing about corpses on golf courses. <laughs> So I told Beatrice that I couldn't see the point in going to Zimbabwe undercover anymore and putting people at risk when it didn't seem to make any difference. 
She told me, if people like you don't report, what's the point of people like me doing what we're doing? It reminded me of the Lorax from Dr. Zeus, who said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. But more and more, I wonder, is bearing witness enough? What's the point of exposing atrocities if nothing is done about them? Over the last year, I've seen and heard some of the most horrific things of my career. In northern Nigeria, where in April 2014, in the small northeastern town of Chibok, more than 200 girls were abducted by Boko Haram from their school dormitory where they were sleeping, making headlines all over the world for a couple of weeks. I found that thousands more girls had been abducted unreported. Some had since been freed in military operations and were in camps, and they told me of how they'd been raped, forced to marry Boko Haram fighters, and then, when they escaped, their own families and communities wouldn't take them back, fearing that they'd been indoctrinated or seeing them as solid. So this weekend, we had some rare good news of 82 of the girls being released after a deal was done. But we shouldn't forget that there's more than 100 Chibok girls still being held, and many others. Then there were the Yazidi girls, um, more than 5,000 women and girls abducted by ISIS and sold into sex slavery for as little as the price of a cigarette packet. About 3,500 of them have now been freed or escaped. One of them, a 16-year-old girl, told me the worst moment of her life as a sex slave was when her captor brought back a 12-year-old girl and raped her all night in the adjoining room as she cried for her mother. I just met this girl here last week who was um, held from the age of 15 and um, raped. And um, she ended up pregnant and having a baby by the ISIS fighters. In fact, I mean, most Yazidi girls um, aborted their children. And so it's quite unusual to, to meet somebody where that happened. Um, and she really, really didn't want to have the baby. She thought it, she said it, she regarded it as a monster. But of course, when it was born, she bonded with it. And then she was put in a truly appalling position of having to decide whether to escape and leave the baby behind or stay. So she escaped and the baby is in Mosul. And now she's watching events in Mosul where lots of civilians are trapped and wondering what's happened to him. I don't mean to sound as if I don't care. But in the past, after interviews like that, I would just fly home and move on to the next story. Of course, I would remember all these people, but I would be caught up with something else. Now, with WhatsApp, I no longer just fly away, but keep in touch with all my stories. Last year, after writing about refugees stranded in the Greek islands, I got a message from a lovely young Afghan girl I'd met called Tuba. Here she is. I saw the article with my photo she wrote to me on WhatsApp. What difference does it make? Sometimes I wonder that too. Afghanistan is where I've spent much of my career, and as I said earlier, where I started off. Of course, I never imagined in the late 80s, when I was first there, that I would be back there 15 years later, covering my own country there particularly as we'd already fought three wars there, not very successfully. Surely we hadn't forgotten Harold Macmillan's rule number one, never invade Afghanistan. <laughs> the war in Afghanistan's now in its 16th year, making it the longest ever war for America and Britain's longest war since the Hundred Years' War, and it has exacted a heavy toll in blood and treasure. The UK and US and other NATO countries officially ended their combat operations at the end of 2014. Um, but two and a half years on, there are still almost 13,000 NATO troops there. And last year, they carried out more than one airstrike a day. Um, indeed, you probably saw very recently the Trump administration dropping the mother of all bombs on part of Afghanistan. 
Yeah, our government would like the public to think that war is over. And I'm afraid that the media seem to have played into their hands by doing very little reporting from Afghanistan since we ended those combat operations. The problem with that is that I've spent the last two years reporting on the refugee crisis, like many of my colleagues, engulfing Europe, the worst refugee crisis since World War II. And while most of the focus has been on the Syrian refugees, the second biggest number are Afghans. Around 300,000 Afghans came into Europe last year, like the girl Tuba. They wouldn't be leaving if the situation in Afghanistan was not so bad. I was just in Afghanistan last month for the first time in two years, and I was really shocked at how the security in Kabul had deteriorated. The Afghan capital has become a city of walls and HESCOs. It's hard to believe that just a few years ago I used to walk around on my own, even at night there. Now, going, just going for coffee in a, one of the few remaining restaurants in Kabul, or buying something in a supermarket, involves passing through checkpoints and then a series of vault-like doors manned by gunmen, and then you get in usually to find there's no power, so there's no coffee anyway. I arrived just after the attack at the country's main military hospital in March, and the mood was really grim. Um, that attack was really the most barbaric attack that Afghanistan has seen. And I met a young female doctor called Nilofar, who described how she was um, in the ear, nose, and throat department on the fifth floor of the hospital and hiding in the shower with five patients and praying as she heard the fighters coming up the stairs floor by floor, shooting patients and doctors and slitting their throats. Finally, they forced open the door of the showers where she was hiding and began shooting at them. She told me, I felt my buttocks explode and blood all around. Then the showers came on, and soon we were lying in blood and cold water. Three of the patients were dead. I was seeing the sky and thought I'd never get out. That hospital is one of the most guarded places in Afghanistan, and on the edge of the green zone, where the US Embassy and NATO headquarters are, it was clearly an inside job, as the fighters knew exactly where to go, and none of the outside gates were blown up. As the news editor of the main private TV channel in Afghanistan, Tolo TV, told me, if they can get in there, they can pop up anywhere. Um, we are also seeing uh, record casualties, um, record civilian casualties in Afghanistan, and the Taliban took 15% more territory over the last year. And we've seen record, not only civilian casualties, but military casualties among the Afghan security forces who are struggling to hold back this resurgent Taliban. Um, last year, they lost more than 8,000 men to the Taliban, um, which is more than double what NATO forces lost in the whole war. So the morale of the Afghan security forces is low, and we keep seeing what they call strategic retreats, which really means abandoning checkpoints from areas of Taliban strength. And two weeks ago, we saw the deadliest attack of the whole war when Taliban in army uniform got into a military base in Balkh and gunned down around 250 soldiers who were having lunch or coming out of prayers. The um, American general, Mick Nicholson, who commands the NATO troops there, testified in Congress in February and gave a very bleak picture um, describing the situation as stalemate and asking for more troops. He said that the Afghan government only controls 57% of the country. He also said the country that we went into more than 15 years ago to prevent it becoming a safe haven for terrorists to launch attacks like 9-11 is now the base for 13 different terrorist groups. He says his main priority now is defeating ISIS, which is trying to set up a new caliphate in southern Afghanistan. And uh, the Moab, the mother of all bombs, was dropped on an ISIS ba base. But many people feel that was the wrong target because the real threat in Afghanistan is the Taliban and to a certain extent Al-Qaeda. 
Um, you may have seen in the news the Pentagon is looking or has recommended sending 3,000 more American troops uh, back into Afghanistan in a ramping up of the war and we're waiting for a tweet from President Trump so that we know what he thinks about it. So how come after all the money that's been spent in Afghanistan and all the lives lost that we're still in this situation. I wrote my book, Farewell Kabul, because I was angry having seen friends and soldiers killed in this war. I wanted to know, was it worth it? Was it worth 3,500 NATO troops killed, of which 456 were British, and the tens of thousands who lost limbs or were scarred in other ways, and around 100,000 Afghans killed? How come 140,000 NATO troops with all the latest technology, missiles that cost the price of a Porsche, could not defeat a Taliban force estimated to be at most 20,000 people. It seems to me if we knew that, we'd know why we can't end wars anymore. Nobody comes out well from my book, in, but in my view, the problem was political more than military. As General MacArthur said, it's fatal to enter any war without the will to win it. It also seemed to me that Afghanistan was where everything started, that short-term decisions made there have had terrifying long-term consequences throughout the whole Middle East. When I started out reporting from Peshawar in 1987, we were still in the Cold War, and the priority of the West was to defeat the Soviet Union. To do this, the CIA and MI6 encouraged the use of jihadi fighters many of whom were former convicts from Arab states that were only too happy to get rid of their troublemakers. When I lived in Peshawar, I used to go to a place called the American Club, which all journalists used to go to because you could get Budweiser's and Sloppy Joe's and Oreo cookie ice cream. Um, and it was just along the road from Bin Laden's guest house for those Arabs. Uh, Never did we imagine then that they would become fanatical terrorists who would fly planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Or that one of them, the Jordanian gangster, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, would move from Herat to northern Iraq after 9-11, alongside Ansar al-Sharia, and announce itself to the world with attacks such as blowing up the UN headquarters in Baghdad in September 2003, and the Shia shrine in Najaf and eventually becoming ISIS. Going through all my notebooks to write this book, I went through every notebook since 1987. It was really chilling to see how those short-term decisions then had had such devastating long-term consequences. And I think the most chilling of all the interviews I reread was with somebody called General Hamid Ghul, who was the Director General of Pakistan's Military Intelligence, ISI, in 1989, he said to me, you in the West think you can use these fundamentalists as cannon fodder, then abandon them, but it will come back to haunt you. One of the most depressing things of my job is that we don't seem to learn from these things. Over the May bank holiday, it being somewhat rainy, I went to the movies and I went to see a film which I highly recommend called Letters from Baghdad. Um, one line particularly struck me. That line was, we rushed into this business with our usual disregard for a comprehensive political scheme. That was spoken by Gertrude Bell, speaking about the British occupation of Iraq, or then Mesopotamia, 100 years ago. Not only was it good to see the recognition of a woman who'd been written out of history, while the men got all the glory. Yes, I'm talking about T. Lawrence. But of course, it could have been today. Having covered all our interventions of the last 15 years, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, it's so frustrating to see how we keep making the same mistakes. In each of those cases, the initial military intervention was successful and quick. It took just 60 days to topple the Taliban, 45 to oust Saddam, a few months to get rid of Gaddafi once NATO got involved. For the fact is, our military has overwhelming firepower. The problem is what you do afterwards. 
I remember before the war in Iraq going to the foreign office here and asking them what their plan was for after the war. They wouldn't tell me. I just thought they were being secretive. It never occurred to me that they had no plan. <laughs> As a result, all of these places are, it's fair to say, in a mess, and hundreds of thousands of people have died. People often ask me why I do what I do, and that's easy, because in the darkest skies, you often find the brightest stars. After the Taliban fell in 2001, I was in Herat, and I walked down a road called Blood Bank Road, and came across a group of women writers who'd risked their lives to study literature. Realizing that the only thing women were allowed to do by the Taliban was sew, they had set up something called the Golden Needle Sewing School. And that's the door to it. It was run by a professor of literature, and under the sequins of material that they carried in their bags, they smuggled in books by James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. They never made a single dress. A few years ago, I was lucky enough to work with Malala, who risked her life to go to school. Yet despite having been shot, she shows no bitterness. She even says she would like to meet the gunman and explain why it's important for girls to go to school, if for no other reason that their own sisters and mothers could be treated by female doctors. It was very nice to see, working with her, another side of her and getting to know her and her family and see that despite her amazing eloquence of bravery, that she's just a normal teenager who fights with her brother. And in fact, when she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, my son, who'd got to know them quite well too and is the same age as her brother, said to me, Mommy, how can Malala win the Nobel Peace Prize? She's always fighting with Kushal. <laughs> Then there was Najin, an amazing Syrian refugee who crossed from Aleppo to Cologne in a wheelchair, always with a smile on her face, telling me how she dreams of being an astronaut and how she educated herself from TV because she couldn't go to school and learnt fluent English from watching American soap operas. She told me how she wondered why food in Europe doesn't look like it does on MasterChef. Um, and how she listed the Romanov emperors to relieve stress when, in, when she was in the boat making the dangerous crossing to Greece. I'd just like to read a little bit from our book to just give some sense of what it's like being a refugee and also Najin's amazing spirit. So this, uh, now she's in Lesbos, but I, she came, you can just see the land the other side, that's where she came from. And so this is her talking from there. From the beach, we could see the island of Lesbos and Europe. The sea stretched either side as far as you could see, and it was not rough, it was quiet, flecked only by the smallest of white caps that looked as if they were dancing on the waves. The island did not look too far off, rising from the sea like a rocky loaf, but the grey dinghies were small and low in the water, weighed down with as many lives as the smugglers could pack in. It was the first time I'd ever seen the sea. The first time for everything, traveling on a plane, in a train, leaving my parents, staying in a hotel, staying in a tent, and now going in a boat. Back in Aleppo, I had barely ever left our fifth floor apartment. We had heard from those who had gone before that on a fine summer day like this, with a working motor, a dinghy takes just over an hour to cross the strait. It was one of the shortest routes from Turkey to Greece, just eight miles. The problem was that the motors were often old and cheap and strained for power with loads of 50 or 60 people, so the trips took three or four hours. On rainy nights when waves reached as high as 10 feet and tossed the boats like toys, sometimes they never made it at all, and journeys of hope ended in a watery grave. The beach was not sandy as I had imagined it would be, but pebbly, impossible for my wheelchair. We could see we were in the right place from a ripped cardboard box printed with the words, inflatable rubber dinghy made in China, maximum capacity 15 passengers. 
as well as a trail of discarded belongings scattered along the shore like a kind of refugee flotsam and jetsam. There were toothbrushes, nappies and biscuit wrappers, abandoned backpacks and a slew of clothes and shoes. Jeans and t-shirts tossed out because there was no room in the boat and smugglers make you travel as light as possible. A pair of grey high-heeled mules with fluffy black pom-poms, which seemed a crazy thing to have brought on this journey. A child's tiny pink uh, sandal decorated with a plastic rose, a boy's light-up trainer, and a large grey floppy bear with a missing eye that must have been hard for someone to leave behind. All this stuff had turned this beautiful place into a rubbish dump, which made me sad. We had been in the olive groves all night after being dropped off on the cliff road by the smuggler's minibus. From there, we had to walk down the hill to the shore, which was about a mile. That may not sound much, but it feels a very long way in a wheelchair over a rough track with only your sister to push and a fierce Turkish sun beating down and driving sweat into your eyes. There was a road zigzagging down the hill, which would have been much easier, but we couldn't walk down that as we might be spotted and arrested by the Turkish gendarmerie, who could put us in a detention center or even send us back. I was with two of my four elder sisters, Nada, though she had her baby and three little girls to handle, and my closest sister, Nazreen, who always looks after me and is as beautiful as her name, which means a white rose that grows on the hills of Kurdistan. Also with us were some cousins whose parents, my aunt and uncle, had been shot dead by Daesh snipers in June when they went to a funeral in Kobani, a day I didn't want to think about. The way was bumpy. Annoyingly, Nazreen pulled the wheelchair so I was facing backwards and only got occasional glimpses of the sea, but when I did, it was sparkling blue. Blue is my favorite color because it's the color of God's planet. Everyone got very hot and bothered. The chair was too big for me and I gripped the side so hard that my arms hurt and my bottom got bruised from all the bumping, but I didn't say anything. As with everywhere we'd passed through, I told my sisters some local information I'd gathered before we left. I was excited that on top of the hill above us was the ancient town of Assos, which had a ruined temple to the goddess Athena, and even better was where Aristotle once lived. He'd started a school of philosophy overlooking the sea so he could watch the tides and challenge the theory of his former master, Plato, that tides were turbulence caused by rivers. As always, my sisters didn't seem very interested. I gave up trying to inform them and watched the seagulls having fun, gliding on thermals and making noisy loops high in the blue, blue sky. How I wished I could fly. Even astronauts don't have that freedom. Nazreen kept checking the Samson smartphone. Our brother Mustafa had bought us for the journey to make sure we were following the Google map coordinates given to us by the smuggler. Yet when we finally got to the shore, it turned out we were not in the right place. Every smuggler has their own point. We had colored strips of fabric tied around our wrists to identify us, and we were at the wrong one. Where we needed to be wasn't far along the beach, but when we got to the end, there was a sheer cliff blocking us off. The only way round was to swim, which we obviously couldn't do. So we'd ended up having to walk up and down another rugged hill. Those slopes were like hell. If you slipped and fell into the sea, you'd definitely be dead. It was so rocky, I couldn't be pushed or pulled, but had to be carried. My cousins teased me. You are the queen, Queen Nugene. By the time we got to the right beach, the sun was sh setting. We spent the night in the olive groves. Once the sun had gone, the temperature dropped suddenly and the ground was hard and rocky, even though Nazreen spread all the clothes we had around me. But I was terribly exhausted, having never spent so much time outside in my life, and I slept most of the night. We couldn't make a fire because it might attract police. Some people used the cardboard dinghy cartons to try and cover themselves. It felt like one of those movies where a group go camping and something terrible happens. I'll just read you one little bit more, which gives some idea of what kind of person Najin is. I don't collect stamps or coins or football cards. I collect facts. 
Most of all, I like facts about physics and space, particularly string theory. Also about history and dynasties like the Romanovs, and controversial people like Howard Hughes and J. Edgar Hoover. My brother Mustafa says I only need to hear something once to remember it exactly. I can list you all the Romanovs from the first one, Tsar Mikhail, to Nicholas II, who was murdered by the Bolsheviks, along with all his family. I can tell you exactly what date Queen Elizabeth II became Queen of England, both the day her father died and her coronation, and the dates of both her birthdays, actual and official. I'd like to meet her one day and ask her, what's it like having Queen Victoria as your great-great-grandmother? And isn't it odd, everyone singing a song about saving you? I can also tell you that the only animal not to make a sound is a giraffe because it has no vocal cords. This used to be one of my favorite facts, but then people started calling our dictator, Bashar al-Assad, the giraffe because he has a long neck and I didn't like them anymore. Now here is a fact I don't think anyone should like. Did you know that one in every 113 people in the world today are refugees or displaced from their homes? Lots of them are escaping wars like the one that has ravaged our country, Syria, or those in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. Others are running from terrorist groups in Pakistan and Somalia, or from persecution by Mullah regimes in Iran and Egypt. Then there are ones fleeing dictatorship in Gambia, forced conscription in Eritrea, and hunger and poverty in countries in Africa I never saw on a map. On TV, I kept hearing reporters say that the mo movement of people from the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia into Europe as, is the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War. In 2015, more than 1.2 million came to Europe, and I was one of them. I hate the word refugee more than any word in the English language. In German, it is Fluchtling, which is just as harsh. What it really means is a second-class citizen with a number scrawled on your hand or printed on a wristband who everyone wishes would somehow go away. The year 2015 was when I became a fact, a statistic, a number. Much as I like facts, we are not numbers. We are human beings, and we all have stories. So these are the kind of stories that I want to bring home in my suitcase. Positive people that give me faith in humanity. Their resilience in the face of adversity shows to me that we're all stronger than we think. This seems to have got stuck. Recently in Kabul, I met an amazing group of Afghan women cyclists who bike through the streets despite men throwing stones at them and shouting abuse. They told me that they see what they are doing as part of women's struggle, and when they're on the bikes, they feel as if they're flying. Best of all were the guitar girls of Kabul, street kids who scrape a living selling chewing gums or scarves. All of them had lost brothers and sisters to suicide bombs or were survivors of attacks themselves. Yet they had the biggest smiles on their faces when they played Fragile by Sting from England. Is it coincidence that all of these people I'm mentioning are female? It seems to me that women are the real heroes of war, for they're the ones who protect, feed, and educate their children when all hell is going on around them. I've seen how women together can be a great force, and that we all want the same for our children, wherever we are. And that one person, one small person like Malala, she's very short, or one small act can make a difference. When you think of war, you might think of guns and bombs and danger and death, and I think of those things too, and I hate those things. But I also think of these people. When you're in a war, small things that often preoccupy us in everyday life, like a train running late or a person irritating you, don't really matter. Instead, you rejoice in finding what one of those guitar girls in Kabul described to me as finding a yellow flower among the rubble. I think that in this time of fake news and alternative facts, where different is often seen as dangerous, 
These real people with real stories are what we really need to hear to give us hope in the future. In the end, we're all looking for that yellow flower. Thank you.